from uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable. We are all evil in some form or another. Yes, I am not 100%, but I am evil. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. This is Serial Killing, a podcast. Hello again, and welcome to Serial Killing, a podcast. My name is Alyssa Carroll, and I am your host and the creator of at serial underscore killing on Instagram, where we veer off the serial killer path to delve into other topics within our beloved true crime community. Special thanks to some of my patrons, of course, Aaron, Katoris, Catherine, Sam, Freddie, Linda, Janice, Hammer, Katarina, Florence, Teresa, Sarah, Sophie, Nanette, two Emmas, Emily, Galen, Cassandra, Bree, David, John, and Judy. Thank you so much. You are truly appreciated. So this week's podcast will be on the murders of 13-year-old Penny Lee Ansel and 12-year-old Melissa Marie Baker. This podcast is dedicated to my friend Steph. Penny Lee Ansel was born on January 9th, 1975, and Melissa Marie Baker on December 5th, 1975, around Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So let's get into some history for that time. This is the year that the Vietnam War ended as the communist forces took Saigon and South Vietnam surrendered unconditionally. The United States involvement in the war ended as well after about 20 years as the last American military members escaped in helicopters. The U.S. also brought Vietnamese orphans back to the U.S. in what they called, quote, Operation Baby Lift. Newspaper heiress Patty Hearst was found in a San Francisco apartment and subsequently arrested for armed robbery. She had been kidnapped in Berkeley, California the year before. Two months after her kidnapping, she sent letters to the media stating she was joining the leftist group SLA, or Symbionese Liberation Army, of her own free will. A surveillance camera took a photo of her helping in an armed robbery at a San Francisco bank, which then made her wanted by the FBI. Once captured, she went to court and was found guilty. She served just two years. 350,000 unarmed Moroccans crossed the border into the Spanish-controlled area of Western Sahara in what was called, quote, the Green March, demanding the return of the Moroccan Sahara Desert. War broke out between Britain and Iceland, known as the Cod War, when Iceland extended its fishing rights out about 200 miles. 1975 was also the beginning of a 15-year civil war between Christian and Muslim militias in Lebanon. Margaret Thatcher became the first woman leader of the opposition for the Conservative Party in the UK. Sony and JVC introduced videotapes and VHS. One of the very first blockbuster films, Jaws, was released this year. Other popular films this year were Benji, Young Frankenstein, which is kind of one of my favorites, and One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Popular bands and musicians of this year were David Bowie, Pink Floyd, Queen, Bruce Springsteen, Bob Marley, Led Zeppelin, and so on. So this was the atmosphere that Penny and Melissa were born into. While there wasn't much information to be found about their early childhoods, Penny and Melissa were both members of the junior high school band and were described as best friends, according to neighbors and people who had known them from school. The former vice president of East Allegheny Junior High School said the girls were, quote, average students who seemed pretty well adjusted, end quote. They caused no issues at school whatsoever that I could find, and the staff and other students liked the girls very much. It was the late summer of 1988, 
early August to be exact. Melissa lived with her mother, Holly Payne, and stepfather Nicholas in East McKeesport, but she was spending time that summer with her father, Joseph Baker, in Irwin, Pennsylvania, just southeast of Pittsburgh. Penny's parents were Donald and Nancy Ansell, who lived in North for sales. She had a sister, Donna, and two half-siblings, Kip, and a Bridget was listed in one source, but I didn't see that name listed anywhere else with any of the other family members on Facebook or anything, so I'm not sure about that one. The two close friends had decided to spend the night together at Melissa's father's house in Irwin so that the next day they could attend the annual Irwin Community Day at Idlewild Park. That Tuesday evening, August 2nd, Penny and Melissa decided to go to the Norwin Hills Shopping Center about 30 miles east of Pittsburgh to a video arcade that was a typical teen hangout at the time. Melissa's grandmother had agreed to pick the girls up at 10 p.m. sharp and they were told not to leave the shopping center. And again, both were described as good girls. There didn't seem to be any worry about that. Around 8 p.m. that night, the girls randomly met two young men, 18-year-old Stephen Mignana, I hope I pronounced that correctly, and 20-year-old Michael Gianta. Probably butchered that one too, I apologize. But let's take a look at these two. So Michael was born in 1967, and that's really all I could find out about him. Going through the newspaper archives around that area produced basically nothing. Suffice to say that he appeared to be at least a decent young man. And then we have Stephen. He was born September 5th, 1969. According to the Pittsburgh Press, he had been a local paper boy for years. He was described as very quiet and a bit of a loner with a very troubled home life. The Pittsburgh Post-Gazette reported that Stephen had been the victim of sexual assault by another neighborhood boy when he was just 10 years old. He had an older brother, Marty, who was said to have been quite the negative influence on him. You see, at this point in our story, well, Marty was already in jail. So in high school, it was reported that Stephen was not a good student, near the bottom of his class, actually. He finished his senior year three credits shy of the requirements and therefore would have had to attend summer school to make up those credits to earn his diploma. The then high school vice principal stated, quote, to my knowledge, he didn't do it, which is referring to the summer school. Basically, his problem was that he didn't have any real direction in life. He didn't know where he was going. Nothing seemed to motivate him. He just didn't care. End quote. He also reported that he was at least a minor disciplinary problem and used to skip classes, but he said he wasn't known to get into fights at school. If he did get into it with a teacher, it was stated that he went out of his way to actually apologize, that in the end, he was respectful and courteous, usually, to the staff. Now, Michael and Stephen had oddly enough met through a church group and enjoyed the same heavy metal music. They developed a close friendship and had even worked at the same restaurant in Pleasant Hills. They rode dirt bikes together, but they also visited a handful of strip clubs in the downtown area as well as a few pornography stores. So on August 2nd, 1988, Stephen and Michael began cruising around the Monroeville Mall in a suburb area outside of Pittsburgh. Now, originally, Michael had wanted to go play some pool or billiard, but Stephen stated he wanted to go pick up girls. So they drank a beer or two and headed over to Norwin Hills Shopping Center southeast of Pittsburgh. There, they saw Melissa and Penny, and Stephen decided to stop and chat with them outside of the video arcade the girls had been in. They talked for a short while, then agreed to get into Stephen's truck, his father's red pickup to be exact, with him and Michael. Now, I want to reiterate that the girls were 12 and 13, the men 18 and 20. Now, Stephen first drove the group to a nearby park, but they then left and he drove to his house in Trafford. 
Neither of his parents were home because his mother worked overnights for the post office and his father traveled for his job, which usually kept him away for a few days at a time. The group went upstairs, listened to music, and chatted before Stephen began kissing Melissa. This prompted Michael and Penny to go back downstairs. It is important to note that Michael and Penny did not do anything past that. There was no sex. But Stephen and Melissa remained upstairs, where it is believed he raped the 12-year-old at knife point. Michael and Penny had remained downstairs, where Penny began to express concern that she and Melissa, who were going to be picked up back at the mall at 10, were going to be late. Michael then yelled upstairs at Stephen, telling him that they needed to get the girls back to the video arcade when he heard a muffled sound coming from upstairs. Now, he wasn't sure what it was, but didn't immediately raise a red flag. Then Stephen came about halfway down the stairs and asked Penny to come upstairs because Melissa wanted to speak with her in the bathroom. So once she had been up there for a few moments, Michael heard a scream and quickly ran upstairs to see what the problem was. It was then that Michael saw Melissa lying in the bathtub, her head near the drain, legs draped over the side. She had what appeared to be a horrible slash to her throat and she was bleeding profusely. At that moment, he later said she was moving her arms slightly and she was desperately still trying to breathe. He looked up and saw Stephen carrying Penny down the stairs and he asked Michael to help him, telling him his hands had been forced in killing Penny because she, quote, knew too much. Michael said to him, quote, I can't do that and in a state of shock left the house. Not knowing exactly what to do and terrified in the moment as any one of us would be, Michael began walking down the road and made it a few blocks down to a local convenience store. He then called his house in hopes that one of his parents would be home, but there was no answer. He then began asking customers who were there to give him a ride back to his area, but they all refused. He later said that he believed it's because he looked so upset or shook up. So he took off on foot again and eventually came to the Trafford Bridge. He was nearly halfway across when he heard a vehicle pull up behind him. He didn't have to look to know it was Stephen. He asked if he could give Michael a ride home. And of course, he didn't want to get into that truck with him because he knew the bodies were in the back bed of that truck. But he was terrified of Stephen at that point and figured his options were to run, take the chance of Stephen running him over, jump over the bridge, or get in the truck. And so he got in. Michael later testified that Stephen, once they began driving, broke down into tears saying he couldn't believe what he had done. And predictably, of course, Stephen didn't actually drive toward Michael's house. Rather, he explained to Michael that, quote, I've got to dump these bodies, end quote, expecting Michael to help him. They drove down a more secluded road and Michael refusing to even touch the remains, Stephen disposed of the bodies over a forested hillside. Michael later said, Quote, I told him I couldn't touch the bodies because it would make me sick. I watched him pull both bodies out of the truck and kick them over the hill. End quote. Stephen then partially covered the remains and left. Luckily, he then actually drove Michael to his home, where he discussed plans for the next day with his friend. He begged him not to turn him in and ended the conversation with, quote, I love you. End quote. Stephen then left and went on to clean the bed of his father's truck out. Back at the shopping mall, when the grandmother returned to pick the girls up, she quickly realized they were nowhere to be found. She became frantic and called the parents, who then, in a panic, called friends, teachers, anyone that they could think of that might have any idea where the girls were. The parents then called the police to report the girls missing. 
So Michael, once inside his house, saw that his parents were home and told them what had happened. And they promptly took him to the police station to report it. The police immediately went out to not only search for the bodies with Michael along to help show them the exact location, but they also went out looking for Stephen. Once they were in Stephen's town, it wasn't hard to spot him driving his father's truck. Stephen saw them approaching and began to try to escape as a police chase ensued. Finally, at 3.30 a.m., the chase ended when Stephen pulled into his own driveway. Other officers had already surrounded the house and Stephen was immediately arrested, taken into custody. He was charged with two counts of criminal homicide. Now, he did willingly show the police where the murder weapon, which happened to be a hunting knife, was in the house. Michael was not arrested or charged with anything. So during questioning, Stephen did admit to murdering the girls, again telling them exactly which knife he had used. And while he felt he had thoroughly cleaned all of the blood up that he could find, police were still able to find blood stains on the bathroom rug and in the back of his father's truck. The blood, of course, matched that of the blood types of both girls. Another find during the search of the house was a satanic Bible in Stephen's room. According to sources, the night of the murders was the eve of a devil-worshipping holiday known as the Satanic Revels. So that got me curious, and I decided to dig and see what this Satanic holiday was all about. Now, the only sources that I could find it on, at least during a general search, were on highly Christian websites. On the site nowfaith.tv, it stated that August 3rd was indeed a holiday called Satanic Revels and that it was a sexual holiday where the, let's say, three main orifices that are generally used during copulation are celebrated and the victim would have to be females between the ages of 7 and 17. Another site, insightfulfoundation.co.uk, has a, quote, ritual abuse calendar, and on it, August 3rd, it cites the same information as the previous site. So I then went to the main satanic website, the satanictemple.com, and looked for that specific holiday or all of the specific holidays, and satanic revels simply was not there. I did an all-over general search for the term Satanic Revels on that site, and it does not exist, at least on their official website. So I'm just throwing that out there. Make of it what you will. The investigators questioned Stephen about him possessing a Satanic Bible, and he admitted that he was studying the religion. So now may I introduce the next character, Father Orlando Prosperi. Again, if I'm butchering names, I apologize. He had served as a Marine during World War II, worked as an undercover federal narcotics agent, passed the bar to become a lawyer, and went on to become an ordained priest all by the time he was 50 years old in 1975. Now, he had been residing in Rome to provide legal services to the American community that lived there. He worked with several Vatican congregations and religious orders and even obtained his degree in canon law. Needless to say, Father Prosperi was a deeply devoted man. Once he heard about this case, he volunteered to assist Stephen's legal team, though I use the term assist quite loosely because it became pretty quickly apparent that he was taking over the whole show. Father Prosperi's health had been in decline, having been diagnosed with an aortic aneurysm and was told to be on bed rest, but he wouldn't hear of it. Stephen later told detectives that after slitting Melissa's throat, he had asked her, quote, why won't you die? He said she responded with, quote, why are you doing this? Then when questioned about sexually assaulting Melissa, he stated that, quote, I sort of talked her into it, end quote. When initially asked why he had killed the young girls, he said, quote, I don't want to talk about that, end quote. 
When asked if Michael had played a role in the murders, Stephen said, quote, Michael had nothing to do with any part, end quote. Stephen was eventually sent to Mayview State Hospital for a mental health evaluation. Mayview was, of course, a psychiatric hospital originally known as Marshall C. Poor Farm, I believe, near Bridgeville, Pennsylvania. It was a large facility with 335 acres, 39 buildings, and 12 of those were used for patient care and hospital administration. It was originally opened in 1893 as a debtor's prison. It has since been closed and was demolished in 2016. And if you would like me to do a series on past psychiatric hospitals, just let me know in the comments below. So a detective testified that Stephen had stated he used a hunting knife to stab both girls, then worked to clean up the blood, placed the bodies in plastic bags, wrapped them in masking tape, then put them in the bed of the truck and dumped them near Johnson Road. Once the bodies were recovered, the autopsies began. Melissa's autopsy had shown that she had three wounds on her neck, facial injuries, and had died from multiple stab wounds to her heart. She also, unfortunately, showed physical signs of rape, such as vaginal lacerations and contusions, as well as a ruptured hymen. So clearly it was not the consensual act that Stephen had said it was, and not that it could have been. She was 12 years old. Penny's autopsy showed that she had died from the neck wound that had cut through her jugular vein and larynx. She too had been stabbed in the heart. There didn't appear to be any signs of sexual assault though. She had, however, managed to rip out a small handful of Stephen's hair and that was found clutched in her hand during the examination. You go girl. Stephen was formally charged additionally with rape and statutory rape. During the trial, it was observed that Stephen appeared to be apathetic during the proceedings. The prosecution sought the death penalty, arguing that he had killed Melissa to silence her so she wouldn't turn him in for raping her and then killed Penny because she too would have been a witness and that certainly seems like a fair argument to me. Now, Father Prosperi argued that Stephen had not really murdered the girls, but that heavy metal music, pornography, and even Satan himself had done the deed. The priest said Stephen was only guilty of aggravated assault because he had only admitted to cutting Melissa's throat, and since that particular wound was not definitively fatal, it wasn't technically murder. He also stated that Michael could very well have inflicted the stab wounds. He claimed that Stephen was not, quote, acting as himself, but complying with Satan's orders, end quote. The priest was even able to somehow find a psychologist who testified that he believed the murders to be unintentional, but had in fact just been an automatic act and that Stephen hadn't been able to tell what was real and what wasn't. The priest delivered a two hour long closing argument, which included Jesus's own dying words of, quote, forgive them for they know not what they do, end quote, desperately trying to spare Stephen's life. That priest actually died just a few years later. It only took the jury two hours to return a verdict of guilty of first-degree murder for both girls and was sentenced to two life-term prison sentences to run consecutively. They knew that he had known exactly what he was doing. But he was spared the death penalty based on the fact that he had no history of prior criminal convictions and slightly because of his age, that he was under the influence of extreme mental or emotional disturbance, and that his capacity to appreciate the criminality of his conduct was substantially impaired when he stabbed the girls to death. Quote, the mitigating circumstances had an influence on the penalty. The jurors feel the boy has a punishment coming and they feel life in prison is just that punishment. End quote. Today, 
those girls would have been 47 and 46 years old. I did some looking into their families and without giving any personal information away, it appears at least that they're doing okay, all things considered. From what I could find, Michael now manages a restaurant in Maryland and that's literally all I could find. Stephen is thankfully still housed in the SCI Somerset Prison in Somerset, Pennsylvania. He is now 51 years old. My thoughts are that these girls were unfortunately murdered during a time in this country's history that has been labeled, quote, satanic panic that originated around 1980 and spread throughout much of the world, actually, by the late 1990s and still has some hold even today. The allegations for the satanic ritual abuse involved the quite sharp increase in reports of physical and sexual abuse inflicted upon people under the context of occult or satanic rituals. Even to this day, there are a plethora of conspiracy theories of a global satanic cult run mostly by the world's most rich and elite, where children are kidnapped or bred underground, you know, out of hospitals, no papers, for the sole purpose of sex trafficking, prostitution, pornography, and even human sacrifices. Literally, just do a basic search on YouTube, and there are so many channels dedicated to this. Some of the stories are completely ludicrous, and others, well, they're a bit more convincing. During the 80s and 90s, all of the daytime talk shows were just a buzz with guests who claimed to either have been a victim of or a party to the whole satanic panic phase. And blaming heavy metal music is quite frankly, boring and outdated. Depending on the age of exposure to pornography, well, that can sort of numb someone to what most would consider normal sexual stimulation. But in 1988, there was no such thing as Pornhub or anything of the kind, no porn streaming service. It was a little harder to get a hold of. I believe that the urge must have already been there and his environment, though we have little concrete information to base that idea off of, was the catalyst for his murders. I do not believe that heavy metal music pushed him to kill, nor do I think pornography did it either. I don't think the biblical Satan himself controlled his mind and moved his hand to kill. But tell me, what do you think? You can leave me a comment below if you're watching, or you can DM me on Instagram at serial underscore killing. You can always email me at serial killing Instagram at gmail.com. And as always, thank you so much for listening. I appreciate every single one of you because I know you could be listening to anyone else, but you chose me. That is awesome. And again, this is dedicated to Steph. I, I really hope that I did it justice. Thanks everyone. Have a great day.